Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, the fastest art critic in the West, and today it's time for the next episode of my Dishonored Let's Play, where we will be wandering around the Hound Pits for a minute and then heading off to visit Caldwin's Bridge. So, um, yeah, the first thing I want to mention is just a <laughs> plea, basically. I just want to take 30 seconds to say, um, I really want to grow my channel and my audience, and, um, like, it's the most satisfying thing about this, well, one of the most satisfying things about making this stuff is new people seeing it and getting to feel the the lovely dopamine rush of, of new people being like, hey, I like your work. So shares are hugely appreciated. It is probably the most helpful thing you can do for me and the best feedback I can get um, is if you just say to people, hey, I like this person's work, check it out. Uh, that is literally all of that. Let's go see what um, we have to do today. You... No? Okay, he's got nothing to say to me whatsoever. Let's have a secret. Admiral Havelock has seen more corpses than all the rest put together. I think we had that one already, actually. I know Good you old don't Sam. have much time, but don't forget to upgrade your gear with Piero, if you like. The boatman has a good heart and respects you. I am glad to know that. Uh, naturally, I was not feel an feeling anxious about that at all because I'm a big, I'm a big grown-up man with with no anxieties and definitely no self-consciousness about whether or not the only one of these dipshits I respect, um, you know, has respect for me. Does he re does he really like me? He thinks I'm cool. He thinks I'm respectable. This is great. Uh, please don't tell anyone I said that, Hart. The younger Pendleton, jealous little Trevor, always in the shadow. Well, we knew that. Corvo, the Loyalist Conspiracy thanks you for your work. I don't know if I can. My own brothers. We never believed that you killed the Empress. It made much more sense that the Royal Spy Master, now the Lord Regent, was behind it, aided by some of his key allies. We spent a lot of money and exposed ourselves to great risk in getting you out of prison. But we did it because we believe that you're the one that can make the difference. Oh. And have locks looking for you. That's pretty much all bullshit. I do not trust this snake. I would not trust this snake as far as I could throw him. And well, I wouldn't trust him as far as I can throw him because, as we've seen, Corvo has a very strong throwing arm for human bodies. But um, I'm going to zip around the place and catch. Well, actually, no. I'm going to talk about like what he says because he is just feeding you bullshit. He's uh, he's feeding you a line of bullshit that he thinks will make you do what he wants to achieve. He's not upset his brothers are gone. He wanted them to be dead. He got you to kill them, and now he's delighted that he can, uh, you know, scrabble together what little benefit he can out of their deaths. Since, you know, as we know, but he doesn't necessarily, the family finances are practically running out already. So it's kind of a, an ironic tragedy to his character, is that he, he goes through all this trouble to try and get a hold of... Um, to try and get a hold of the family finances, to, to take over from the brothers who he's constantly felt sidelined by for his entire life, um, only to discover that the silver mine is, is all dried up. So, um, joke's on him, I guess. I'm not sure I remember to check this the last time. Pendleton was willing to go further than I thought. He served up his own flesh and blood to the cause. I can see he's truly loyal to the Empire. Could I have done the same if my brother was alive today? Probably. Undoubtedly. Many innocents must be sacrificed for the good of Dunwall. Every loyal watchman that falls to Corvo's blade is giving his life for the Empire. So, this lays bare the kind of misapprehensions in, um, in Havelock's mind. He doesn't tend to think of other people as being very different from himself. He decides that if they act in a way that is similar to how he wants them to act, or how he thinks they are going to act, or how they should act, then he has understood them and they are similar or different to himself. He concludes that because uh, Pendleton was willing to make this sacrifice, because Pendleton was willing to um, see, the, see the deaths of his brothers, um, that Pendleton must be loyal to the cause and to the Empire, and not merely seeking power for its own sake, because, well, he gave up his brothers. The idea that he fucking hates his brothers and has resented them for their entire lives uh, does not really enter into his head. And I think this is a, a classical depiction of a character, because these archetypes are, you know, these are classical character archetypes for a reason, you know? There is a reason why these tropes get repeated over time, and I think that something being a consistent character that's appeared in many works of fiction, of fiction doesn't make it bad, it just means that you have to execute it well. And I do think these characters are executed well, 
extremely well for how briefly they, they appear. Corvo, thank you for let getting me a live weeper. This is going to be invaluable for my old friend at the Academy of Natural Philosophy, as living plague specimens are difficult to procure. Rest assured, my colleague will handle this situation as humanely as possible. And here, of course, we have um, another indicator of just how unethical uh, Piero is. Like, this is not a living person to him. This is a a subject, a, a rat for him to dissect. Also, um, it is kind of funny to me that they just take away your mattress so you can't sleep. I don't know if anyone ever had, like... Like, I don't know. If you couldn't get up in the morning, your parents take your duvet away or whatever. I don't want to look around right now. Of course. We can give you the tour later, when you've rested. I was wondering... Do you think my mother is really dead? I saw her get stabbed, but maybe she was still alive and got better. Is that possible? I'm sorry, Emily. But no. She did not survive. Oh. Did you go to her funeral? Was it fancy and beautiful? A train of carriages rode through the city. It was very beautiful. Flowers everywhere. And thousands of people wept because they will miss her. I wish I could have seen it. I'm sorry, dear. It's kind of heartbreaking, the tragedy of, like, part of the tragedy of this narrative is everything that's put upon this, this poor child. The expectations put upon her as, you know, the leader and the manipulations applied to her by people who want to control her. But the simple tragedy of a child not being able to go to her mother's funeral is, is, is low-key heartbreaking. Hey, sweetie, how are you holding up? I mean, this place isn't as pretty as the Golden Cat, but I like it better anyway. You can see the tower across the river from here. That's where my mother died. I've been planning for Emily. Lesson plans are together. A schedule is prepared. We will make life as normal as possible here. So, um... Let's just check in with the heart and see what they have, to, what it has to say about her. She sees more than she is telling, young lady Emily. Poor Emily. Her childhood is lost. She has become a pawn in the games of men. Which is a more entertainingly florid way to say the exact same thing that I just said. Um, also, note that the characters in this room are speaking with a very loud echo. Um, that is completely incorrect for the space they're in. Just because there's a crack in the ceiling doesn't mean they should be echoing like that. That's not really how sound waves and whack echoes work. Anyway, let's catch up with the plot. All right, my friend. Martin's devised our next move. There's a footnote in Campbell's journal that tells us the Lord Regent's mistress sat for a portrait with Sokolov, the painter and royal physician. He'll be able to give us her name. Sokolov lives on Caldwin's Bridge about half the time, out over the river. The catch is that I'm afraid you've got to head out right away while Sokolov is at his apartment on the bridge. Samuel can get you close to the bridge, but you'll have to find Sokolov. Bring him back here intact, and it'll enable us to make our next move. I can't believe what you've done so far. Escaping from Coldridge, taking down the High Overseer, recovering Emily. You make this old military man proud. That's it, then. I don't remember if we read this before, but I'm going to read it again because it, it gives us some inf interesting information about Piero's mindset, which is going to be relevant. Excerpt from a series of newspaper articles from prominent natural philosophers by Piero Joplin. It is through no fault of my own that the average citizen has expressed a preference for Sokolov's elixir over my own formula, sold as Piero's remedy, a name I did not choose if you must know the truth. The public has spoken its usual message of idiocy spending their coin as a means of selecting Sokolov's formula over mine, which I believe to be the equal, if not superior. Much has been made over the popularity of these concoctions as a means of resisting this remarkable new plague. I say remarkable because this strain works with an efficiency we have not seen in the history of the Empire. This plague, now wait, making its way through the city of Donwall, is unrivaled in its effectiveness. I have studied it with the blood of those afflicted, and it is nearly perfect. Elegant, in fact. And while it is true that Piero's remedy and Sokolov's elixir are known to protect the body against the plague equally, my own has properties not fully understood which relate to the mind itself and the spirit. It is this way that my formula wins out, here where one should pay attention to this contest. For you see, Sokolov's elixir, with its emphasis on the brute animal body, is a crass goo better suited for livestock. The subtle and secret variants in the key ingredients making up Piero's remedy ensure that it works on the higher functions that separate humankind from the mindless blue-jawed hagfish swimming in the Renhaven River. So, P 
Piero is just like that. He is that kind of person. He is very, very arrogantly obsessed with his own uh, his own brilliance as compared to those around him. Um, he, he makes a marked counter to Sokolov, who is confident in his um, in his superiority, whereas Piero is very um, very anxious in his superiority. He's, he's, he's constantly determined to assert, um, regardless of the face of the evidence, that he, you know what he does is brilliant, what other people do is stupid. It is not merely enough that he is better than other people, it, he must other people must also be worse than him. So, let's see what you got for me. Ask me for any gear you need. So at this stage we have now picked up um, pretty much all of the useful upgrades for a non-lethal run. There's no point upgrading things like spring razors because they only do- th they only kill people. Um, and the pistol, again, it really is only useful in combat with other humans. Bullets, bolts, Grenades. Well, grenade capacity might be worth upgrading. Um, yeah, so luckily we don't need to completely fill up on sleep darts. It's worth grabbing almost all of these, though. And the rest of these aren't an issue. Because, um, again, as we spoke about ages and ages ago, one of the flaws with this game's uh, design is that y you are in incentivized to play non-lethally. However, if you play non-lethally, you don't use most of the tools and you basically never run out of resources. Let's head out. Off to Caldwin's bridge, sir. We'll get our sleep later. Just climb aboard when you're ready. What do you think, Corvo? Caldwin's bridge. You've been in the city for years, but you lived in Dunwall Tower with the late Empress, so maybe you haven't visited the bridge before tonight. Something to look out for. See all them lights on the water? That's right, we'll be spotted for sure. You're gonna have to shut off their power before I can pick you up. Now, about bringing Sokolov back alive, he's smart. Maybe even smarter than Piero. Got the whole of Dunwall under his thumb with all that natural philosophy business. New technology, potions and the like. Seems dangerous to me. But what do I know? Here we are. I'll meet you at the arches under Sokolov's place when you're ready, Corvo. Assuming, of course, you've taken care of those floodlights. So it actually is necessary for you to switch the floodlights off. Logic would dictate that if you can sneak through um, one way with the lights on, you could sneak back out with them off and take uh, Sokolov's supine form with you. However, um, <laughs> it's a basic limitation of the game that you can't take people through, um, you know, cell changes. You can't carry someone through a door that uh, yeah, loads you into a different load zone. But if we do see someone, then what? Do we say something? Remind them about curfew? Mm -hmm. No. You don't remind them. You chase them down, and you give them a severely deadly beating is what. Okay. Yeah, I got it. No point in yelling at me. Severely deadly beating. So yeah, um... Police are the same. That's just That's just how it is, I guess. Uh, right, so, this whole section is very heavily modelled on the um, classical depictions of London Bridge, which I think is really neat and interesting, because um, the historical high medieval London Bridge is what people think of as, well, actually. Um, most uh, most, most non-Brits, and indeed many non-Londoners tend to think of... Oh shit. Well, um... He won't be thinking of bridges ever again. Unfortunately, uh, he turned around at the wrong time. This is just... It's one of the, the occupational hazards of being a guard. Um, ultimately, these and ultimately these uh, tragic events are no one's fault. They simply happen. Now, this guy's got his back to a wall, which is really inconvenient. Um, this guard is is kind of notable to me for being one of the most irritating guards in the world to deal with. If you want to stealth through this section and feel the need to take out the guards for whatever reason, he lays bare the um, careful randomness of the the guard programming. 
Guards have specific patrol routes, but they also have semi-randomized behaviors. Some guards are static, they stay in one place, some guards have patrol routes that they stick to, and some guards wander randomly within a certain area. Sometimes this guy goes for a piss, sometimes he has a smoke, sometimes he leans against this, sometimes he goes around. Leaning hmm. against a wall is unfortunate because it means you can't knock someone out easily. I really wish he would turn around. Um, but yeah, these combinations of behaviour add a randomness to the... Uh... There you go, see, I told you. Um, add a randomness to this game, which is a little bit less usual for uh, immersive sims and stealth games. It's one of the reasons why this is one of the best stealth games and immersive sims ever made. Uh, the fact that you can... And yep, that's why I knocked these guys out, in case you... Oh shit. Got to remember, there is always another guard. Um, this was entirely cockiness on... You know, I'll, I'll take the L here, this was down to me. So yeah, one of the reasons why this is such a good stealth game is that these guard behaviours are both predictable and randomised. It's never quite the same, but it's often quite similar, and the, one of the flaws with procedural generation in games generally is that you see the patterns. You ultimately, um, you know... If you play a roguelike, you learn to recognise the chunks, the kinds of rooms that appear, the kinds of layouts that appear, and sooner or later you realise that you are merely observing a um, hundred variations of the same thing, but they aren't meaningfully different. Whereas the randomised behaviour of a guard, the tension of sneaking up a guard behind someone and not knowing if they're going to turn around and see you, that is always tense, even if you've done it a hundred times and know exactly what you're doing. And so adding that in, that randomization but retaining the predictability actually works in this context where it doesn't in uh, in a lot of procedural generation contexts. So I was talking about London Bridge because... You know anybody with signs of the sickness? Okay. Yeah, see, these are two more of the randomized guard barks that um, they can just say. They have five or six openings and five or six responses, which it just mix and ma mixes and mashes. Mixes and mashes? Mix, mix, mash, mishy, mash, mish, mash. And, uh, you know, standing aside all of the other many um, game references to, you know, the previous examples of the genre is um, the fact that they say blow off Choffer. This is uh, an intentional kind of um, callback or reference to the tradition in the Thief series where the guards would, uh, would call you or one another Taffa, which was a, a made up insult. It's kind of... Um, it doesn't have to be considered a re direct reference, but given the heritage of this game, it seems very likely that it is. That's actually not necessary. That's how you get past here if you don't have the high jump or the teleport ability, but you can always blink. And even if you... Um, even if you are doing a no magic run, there is, you know, this game was designed around you using the magic. It wasn't until the second game that they actually facilitated a no magic run because they didn't expect people would actually play with no magic, for fairly obvious reasons. This is my favourite roller coaster. It's been so long since I've been on a decent cart ride. This is a fun little mechanism by which to bypass this entire stealth section. Um, if you manage to stay up here, you can basically stay completely out of, out of sight from these guys. During this period... There's very little to gather on the ground floor. There are some weapons, which we don't need. Some potions, which we don't need. Some assorted other doodads and flimflammery. But, um, yeah, so... This whole sequence is um, directly inspired by uh, the medieval, the, the old London Bridge. Which um, was actually... People think that it fell down, and that's why it doesn't exist anymore. People think that the, there was a major collapse, and that's why that's what happened to it. But that's not actually the case. There were some minor collapses over the course of its, course of its history, history, and it was, was very often like collapsing um, and shedding bits of masonry, but there was no singular grand collapse that resulted in the decommissioning of the bridge. Additionally, non-Londoners tend to think that London Bridge is the, uh, the big suspension bridge. That's not the case, that's Tower Bridge and uh, it will behoove you to remember that correctly. Ah, oh, beans. Might be 
Do these have a drop? Oh, no, okay. I might change the size of my reticle because it keeps blending in with uh, the ground and I do keep finding myself wasting things. Ouch. Ah, unfortunate. I do seem to be... Huh, hmm. I wonder if there's a, there's a class dimension to which of these guys I kill and which I don't because I do tend to find myself stabbing the lower guards who are... Uh, uh, very very badly trained. They are the lowest level of guard. They have the least skill, the least combat ability uh, in mechanical terms as well as in narrative terms. But also they do seem to be the ones that I accidentally stumble into the most. So um, let's try and be a little bit less murdery today. Uh, regardless, the, um, the classic image of, of London Bridge obviously no longer exists. And if you aren't aware of it, then... This is unfortunate for him too, isn't it? Are you, are you, excuse me, sir, are you? Well, isn't that just the darndest thing? I didn't even kill this one. Um, I mean, this is just really why we need to enact strict safety standards. As you can see, part of the uh, railing here has been removed, which is in clear con contravention of um, DOSHA standards, which is obviously the Donwall Office of um, Safety Assessments. And... Um, it's tragic. This this tragedy could easily have been avoided if not for the fact that um, someone somewhere has decided to contravene safety standards for their own convenience. It's completely unacceptable and it is not the way we conduct things in a civilised society. There's nothing else here, so let's move back. Um, as, I, <laughs> as I mentioned, like, ragdolls in this game are incredibly fragile. What happened was that he got too close to... The, he um, His animation got him too close to the edge in a way that... Uh, the game defaults to someone stumbling and falling down. Um, he ragdolled, the physics of his ragdoll pulled him off the edge and he fell down on his head and that was the end for him. Which is not entirely inaccurate to real life. The human neck is incredibly fragile and other phrases that I say that make me sound incredibly sinister. But um, unfortunately for this guy, that was all it took. So uh, yeah, London Bridge. London Bridge, uh, it was actually built in the, um, it was actually built in the Middle Ages. It was, it was commissioned by Henry VIII and, um, it very quickly became heavily inhabited. People built their homes on the bridge. If you aren't familiar with the classical depictions of, um, London Bridge, then the image of it is simply very striking. The, um, this, this idea of a bridge that has, um, houses built along it is a uh, is quite a striking image. It's an unusual thing to see because it's so rare in the modern day for fairly obvious reasons. But um, historically it hasn't been that uncommon. Even a wealthy man like you needs the city watch. Gangs are cutting throats and smashing windows left and right and the weepers, excuse me, the plague victims are worse. Are you saying the Lord Regent is wrong for imposing curfew? It won't do you any good to bait me, officer. But don't worry, I'll be fine. I'll profit. A smart man can come out ahead, even in the time of plague. Sure, like that Sokolov. He's doing fine. Always a lot of exotic items coming and going from his place. Keeps this place running, at least for now. Yes, yes, if by exotic you mean foul-smelling as a witch's bottom. The royal physician will be fine too, until he crosses the wrong man. This guy seems overly familiar with the smell of witch's bottoms. I'm going to say that much about him. So this actually, uh, I think this is Pratchett of Pratchett's Jellied Eels, uh, which is one of the food items you can consume during the game. You see advertising for it everywhere. He is a well-known industrialist in this uh, in this area. It's a nice detail that um, he exists as a person and you can come and find him. Uh, it doesn't interact in any like further way with anything, really. It's just... He's here. Uh, hey, it's that guy you know from the advert, the advertisements, which is like... It, I find that really endearing. The fact that he is an eel merchant is not relevant. It's just, you know, we wanted to have a noble... Or, well, not a noble, a wealthy man here. And so we did. <clears throat> and hey, we have... Uh, why not make it the same guy? It's just a nice little touch. Anyway, um, yeah, so that is going to be all from me for today. We'll finish exploring the bridge next time, so join me for that, and uh, thank you for watching!
If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one-tweet micro-reviews, or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi, or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.